morning, everybody. Professor Atanius Raptoris is a famous professor. It's a full professor. And he has a member of the board, more than 15 journal and, and uh, publication. He has won the, the Arthur Smith Award from the Audio Society and the expert for Stone. So you have the, the microphone, you can begin. Thanks very much, Ravi. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, great honor. Uh, the title of the lecture is not uh, uh, included in this session uh, from the very beginning, uh, but the change of the flights uh, forced us to have this as the first lecture of the day. Uh, it's the SAU lecture, so uh, for me, uh, special thanks to SAU for the honor to represent this organization to uh, your Congress and of course uh, to the Congress uh, and uh, the organizing committee. Uh, I'm among friends and uh, for me, uh, neighbors in the Mediterranean and Gulf area should uh, meet as uh, uh, frequent as usual. So let's go to uh, the topic regarding um, uh, our uh, different modalities for lithiasis treatment. As we know from uh, the work that we've done with uh, ESUT, uh, we have more and more publications uh, regarding uh, Flexi URS. For ESWL, not so many. And if we put um, to PubMed uh, the terms uh, disposable Flexi URS, you can see that we have publications that uh, build up uh, year by year. So the interest uh, is growing. According to the guidelines, uh, we can use um, uh, rears, flexi URS, uh, for stones even bigger than two centimeters. This will change, uh, and instead of the diameter, we're gonna include the stone volume in the future. So it's something from uh, the future guidelines. Uh, as we are discussing about the EAU guidelines, it's uh, clearly stated that the introduction of disposables has uh, increased the use of flex URS. And the truth is that we have younger consultant urologists that do flex URS instead of PCNL. And there are patients that prefer to have uh, rears instead of PCNL. Also, in addition, we have the International Lives of Urethiasis guidelines that uh, state uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, the same uh, suggestions. But when we treat uh, a stone, it's not just a stone. We treat uh, a stone in a kidney in a patient. So we have to take into consideration all the parameters stated in this table regarding the stone, the renal anatomy, and uh, the clinical parameters for sure to decide what exactly we're gonna do. Actually, uh, Flexi URS uh, is to compete with mini PCNL. And uh, according to the experience that we have, we're gonna proceed to either of these two treatment modalities. But both are modern modalities that are quite attractive. And we can see the pros and cons uh, as stated in this uh, table. But for sure, the experience is uh, the most serious parameter to take into account. I won't go through to meta-analysis because these are things that we know. I'll just uh, uh, have a slide regarding the complications of PCNL because it's a, a problem to have major complications. And this is from uh, a publication that we presented in London. We had five cases of colon perforation when we did uh, for 10 years uh, our audit. And these were cases uh, when we were trying initially to uh, actually train ourselves with a supine position. But colon perforation is a very major complication and four out of the five cases were treated conservatively, but in one case we had to do a laparotomy. So if uh, we go to patients, patients prefer rears. If we go to surgeons, also surgeons may prefer rears, especially the younger surgeons. When we go through literature, and I've uh, published a lot regarding flex URS, we'll understand that uh, the increase in the rears operation is also because we have better instruments. So with uh, more powerful lasers, it's more easy to do uh, lithotripsy of a stone. And actually, during the last 100 years of ureteroscopy, things have uh, uh, innovated a lot. 
I was one of the lucky urologists uh, that uh, first tested uh, the digital flexible ureteroscope of Olympus in London, 2006. And since then, we have a new generation. It's the disposable digital flex URS. This is the fifth generation. And actually, when we compare the different generations, we can see that we have instruments that uh, can do all the deflection maneuvers within the range of all the PC system, even if you have inside wires, lasers, etc., and baskets. So we need uh, to go from um, the fiber optic to the digital era, and uh, even if we use the reusable flexi scope, we have an operation where we can do it quicker because it's uh, the chip on the tip technology with the camera. So we have a scope which is lighter, which is easy for us to handle. We can uh, treat bigger stones, we can see better, we can zoom better, and this ends up to have an operation which is safer, quicker, and more efficient. The problem initially with the digital uh, flexi scopes was uh, that because uh, the chip was on the tip, it increases the diameter of the scope. And that's why we initially had to use more ureter accesses. But now, this has changed, as we will see with the mini uh, flexi URS, the disposable one. The problem with uh, non-disposable reusable scopes was that after a, a number of 20 to 30 cases, we had to have a new one. And this was something that could actually end up with cancellation of cases. So only the cost is actually an issue regarding the disposable scopes. We have advantages regarding even training for our young uh, colleagues. And also, there are absolute uh, advantages like uh, infectious cases where you cannot use the same scope. This is a review from British Journal of Urology a couple of months ago where you can see the advantages and disadvantages of the disposable uh, scopes, single-use scopes. Some of us use the term single-use, some of us use the term disposable. And this has to do if you are using this uh, scope again in other cases, because these scopes don't have a time frame. They may have four hours, eight hours, or no time limit. So that means that you can use them in another case, but my suggestion is not to use them the same day in another patient because the sterilization process should be better. So the market of disposable uh, flexiscopes is actually exploding. We have many, many uh, companies that actually produced several disposable scopes, but for sure, if uh, the price is lower, it's cost effective. And for sure, we have absolute advantages and indications, like when we have uh, some uh, super resistant bugs, HIV cases, and uh, when the patient himself wants to have a new scope to treat his stone. So let's see the market of the disposable scopes. The first one was the lethal view from Boston Scientific. And after, we had the first generation of the pushing. Then we had the second generation of the pushing. And many, many companies came, and the market has been uh, pretty much packed with all these new proposals. And we can actually compare several of these models, and uh, there are several reviews. And as you can see, there are several parameters that we compare, like um, the deflection if up and down. So we can see that we have very, very good deflection the weight, very light scopes, the length, the friends, as I told you before. We started with nine friends, but now we have even 7.4 friends. Very important is where we have the working channel exit. It could be three o'clock, it could be nine o'clock, it could be 12 o'clock. And why I'm saying this? Because there are some difficult cases where you cannot actually access the stone in a calyx. So it's very important to know that you can use different scopes with different uh, exits to treat stones in right or left kidney. So my proposal is for the right kidney to use 
uh, scopes with an exit three o'clock and for the left kidney nine o'clock, regardless of the technique that you are using. I use many scopes. Uh, the last period, I have a preference for the huge met scope because it has the 7.5 French diameter and it has different scopes for right and left kidney because the company provides you uh, the three and nine o'clock exit. And also with competition, we'll have new scopes like the one that will come 6.3. So we're gonna have slimmer scopes like the end of you by uh, huge met. And why it's important to have a very small diameter? Because you're gonna have uh, this part within the unit and the scope where we have a better uh, decrease of the pressure as uh, we're gonna have the aspiration if you want and also we could use these scopes without, without a JJ stent before or sometimes we don't use an accessive. So it's very important to have good scopes, very good bendings and um, for me uh, that's the future. So I don't want to waste more time, just a few slides regarding the pressure and the temperature. It's something that um, give us a lot of uh, uh, notice nowadays. I was chairing the relevant session in EAU 2022, and actually we had uh, uh, many publications regarding the pressure, and that's why we have scopes with uh, measurements of the pressure. Regarding temperature, we have the last year more publications. The conclusion of this session was that in selective cases where you have patients that are prone to urosepsis, you may need to measure the pressure. So always be cautious with the pressure and the temperature because you may lose a patient uh, not from bleeding when you're doing rears, but from urosepsis. Uh, so for me to conclude the last slide, mini flexible disposable URS is the future. Uh, and of course, training with simulators, it's something that uh, we actually all uh, suggest. So thanks very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor uh, Atanius, for responding to the times. So now you move to second presentation. We invite Dr. Yahya Azwani, to present the management of male louts in young adult. It's a head section of Urology King Abdazi Medical Center, Minister of National Riyadh and also professor in King Saudi in Abdelaziz University. Good morning, thank you, Chairman. And uh, it's actually an honor for me to um, present in this uh, meeting. I would like to thank uh, our colleague and brothers from uh, Kuwait Urology Association and uh, from Arab uh, uh, Urology Society for uh, their kind invitation to, be, uh, to participate in this uh, meeting. And I will shed a light on uh, management of lowering tract symptoms in uh, young male, which is, um, again, it is uh, one of the uh, difficult subject, clinical subject to see uh, in, uh, when you're facing the um, uh, usual uh, clinics. Uh, and uh, it needs like uh, special attention because unfortunately we don't have a uh, direction for treatment since uh, uh, still, I mean, we don't like uh, uh, treat them like uh, uh, old, I mean, elderly adults who's having large prostate. So uh, this making their uh, presentation and clinical treatment probably challenging. We all know that the standardization of lower tract symptoms, uh, it was there since almost three decades, and uh, it's classified into uh, three categories, as uh, storage symptoms, uh, foiling symptoms, and post uh symptoms. And uh, this classification is uh, a common language used all over the world and uh, uh, between all uh, urologists, either subspecialized as foiling dysfunction or other uh, uh, subspeciality. But specifically about a uh, young male uh, group, uh, do we have any uh, prevalence of their lower tract symptoms? Uh, what the common and predominant symptoms uh, they have? Uh, 
Uh, there are uh, many studies actually in uh, prevalence of lower urinary tract symptoms in general, and including both genders, and it's not specific for age. But if we come to like uh, uh, dissect these studies, like uh, the famous study is EPIC study, which was published in 2005, and it's among uh, uh, five countries, four of them from Europe and uh, Canada. And they had in this study uh, 7,210 men, and 62% uh, or more than that uh, uh, in, 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 in this study, they reported individual lower urinary tract symptoms, and it's increasing with age. Storage symptoms are the predominant symptoms uh, in, uh, in men group in general, but if we come to uh, um, specifically to this age group and those uh, male less than 50, they, uh, the predominant symptoms here is uh, uh, nocturia. In uh, finding uh, symptoms there, uh, in this age group, the predominant symptom is um, mainly terminal dribbling. So this is in uh, another in, in, in part of the world, which is uh, Europe and uh, Canada, as I mentioned. Another study in uh, United States, which again didn't specifically tackle this uh, age uh, uh, group, but if we come to uh, their uh, result and when they categorize like those patients or divide their uh, age group to uh, uh, young and uh, more, um, young adults or more than uh, 40, we'll find their average age of men is 41, which included in this study, uh, among 10,000 participants as a, um, a, a telephone uh, survey. And the most prevalent lower intact symptoms among men was uh, terminal uh, dribbling, which represent around 37%. Uh, it differ according to uh, uh, ethnicity group and uh, racial group. And in our countries, Arab countries, the, um, there are many studies, but again, it's like not focusing on age group specifically. It's uh, um, for all uh, age group, uh, both genders. But uh, there is an EPIC study which was conducted in Egypt and led by Prof. Murad. It's in three cities, uh, major cities in, in, in Egypt. And uh, they divide their uh, male uh, group into uh, two age groups, less than 39 or more than 40, and if we look at the uh, uh, less than 39-year-old uh, male, they, we will find that, uh, again, the storage symptoms, probably the predominant uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. So we can say that probably lower urinary tract symptoms uh, uh, differ from uh, place to place according to um, um, to uh, perception of these uh, symptoms uh, according of, uh, it also uh, differ according to uh, the survey that was uh, done, and uh, it's not like uh, constant in all uh, countries, but uh, we can conclude predominant symptom is uh, uh, storage symptoms in, in general. The clinical presentation of this age group is not like uh, what we are expecting in uh, uh, more or like in an in age above 50. They usually presented uh, frustrated. They are unsatisfied, unfortunately, because they were visited many doctors, uh, starting from family medicine, family physicians to urologists, subspecialized urologists. Unfortunately, they couldn't find a uh, treatment for their symptoms. They have a lot of investigations. They have a lot of medications, and just they presented to you in the clinic with these bags of investigation, box of uh, investigations and bags of medication, just throw it on your uh, desk, and their story started. Uh, sometimes uh, you will uh, try to help them, but unfortunately, because they lost this trust, sometimes they, are look, they will again look for another, another, uh, another doctor. And this is the, uh, the, uh, the problem because it's affected their uh, quality of life, and they are thinking of like another uh, um, progression of this disease, maybe, or maybe these symptoms, uh, like thinking of uh, cancers or something like that. And also, it's not presented as only lower in fact symptoms, usually associated with sporadic pain here and there, pelvic area, suprapubic area, preanal, perineal area, benign pain sometimes. So this is also making it like uh, difficult to uh, uh, specify and categorize it or like uh, uh, 
uh, link it to a, a specific organ. The approach, it will be the same like uh, approaching lower end tract symptoms by taking history, which will uh, definitely will uh, uh, recognize for you like uh, potential causes. Uh, you will review patient morbidity, medications, lifestyles, and habit. But it's also crucial for these patients to assess their characteristics, expectations, and preference. And this is one of the things that you will put on in, 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 in your mind. Symptoms, uh, questionnaires, and also finding diaries, these are the things also that you will uh, uh, use to help you in the clinic also to uh, know their fluid intake and fluid uh, uh, intake habits, and also their severity of symptoms and how it's affecting their quality of life. And then you will go with investigation according to uh, your uh, finding clinical examination. And it's again, it's uh, probably the same like in, in, in age above 50, but here specifically, uh, if you are doing digital rectal examination, get the chance and do for them uh, STEMI test. Uh, it, it's also uh, sometimes helpful. Semen culture, I find, I find it actually an, uh, helpful specifically in those patients with lower with, with uh, pain associated associated with uh, lower intract symptoms. You can see here that there is a lot of etiologies and it's more or even than 50 etiology. Definitely you will not be able to just uh, uh, choose one of them and label your patient having this uh, diagnosis. So the diagnosis is, is, is usually empiric and many patients labeled as having chronic prostatitis or bilfic pain syndrome of active bladder sometimes or simply finding dysfunction. And according to that, the symptoms you or the treatment usually is empiric. So is any, there any other tool that can help us in the clinic to uh, probably um, more like uh, specify our diagnosis, uh, uh, listen uh, or like tailor our uh, long list of etiologies and probably treat them accordingly. The, uh, published literature on using urodynamic study in those uh, specific age group uh, showed that the changing of diagnosis in those patients after urodynamic probably reaching to 80%, which is, I mean, a good percentage, and it's really uh, uh, surprising because not always we are using urodynamic study in those patients, but after uh, reviewing literature, a lot of literature, probably using urodynamic, it may guide us to, uh, uh, to, uh, to diagnose, or at, at least approaching a diagnosis. And it's, it's different from fiduurodynamic, where it's more specific, it's up to like 97% you'll find abnormality. The uh, most common abnormality in fiduurodynamic is usually blood or neck uh, obstruction, which represents almost, almost like 50% of those uh, patients. Um, with the limitation of urodynamic subjectivity, also uh, uh, lack of uh, like uh, predictability of certain parameters like EMG, but it's still it's a tool that can be used concomitantly with others like cystoscopy, questionnaires, and uh, ultrasound, measurement of postpoid residual, and uh, um, also Euroflow. Uh, here, the summary of the last published study over the last three years, uh, 30 years, where they are like assessing the role of urodynamic in this age group. As we can see, the average age is less than 40. And they are, there are like seven uh, studies, uh, three quarter of them using fiduurodynamic study. And almost the constant finding is uh, uh, obstruction which is again like changing our uh, like thinking to uh, uh, a primary blood or neck uh, obstruction. It's surprisingly that more, uh, some studies they don't even uh, I mean, report the detrosal of our uh, activity. And the second reason probably will be dysfunctional foiling and the third reason will be detrosal under activity. So primary blood and neck obstruction as a considerable diagnosis in those young uh, uh, male patients, it's not new. It was there since 1984. It categorized by as uh, in, in the um, in the uh, conventional urodynamic and pressure flow study that there is high foiling detrosal pressure, low urofflow with obstructive pattern, and narrowing of blood or neck uh, on a fluoroscopy uh, examination, and with uh, uh, also uh, uh, EMG a lack of activity. Uh, we can see that the primary bladder neck will decrease with uh, age and uh, the probability will increase with a severity of uh, uh, 
IBSS or uh, yeah, questionnaires and uh, uh, lower attack symptoms. So we have storage symptoms, which is the predominant fa uh, symptoms. We are here having like voiding uh, or uh, vibranial blood neck obstruction, which sounds like voiding symptoms. So here we are like in two uh, or between uh, two uh, classification. So I think the most uh, hub here that we uh, need to think about it is a bladder neck. And it was, this was confirmed uh, lately in July this year by histopathology study where they confirmed that there is a relationship between infection, inflammation, uh, inflammatory uh, inflammation process that developed at the, prime, at the uh, prostate with primary bladder neck obstruction. So this probably will lead us to think about the bladder neck more than uh, uh, thinking about the prostate or, uh, or only the bladder uh, alone. Is it acquired condition? It can be. It is uh, uh, increased also sometimes in efferent sympathetic activity. Our management approach will be mainly a multimodal approach, and we have a, a, a U point uh, approach, which is mainly for chronic prostatitis, but it also can help us in treatment of those patients. It, it was modified in 2016 by adding S, which stands for sexual uh, dysfunction, and I think this is also one of the considerations that we, con we can consider, especially after introduction of um, BD5 inhibitors as treatment of lower tract symptoms. So the take home message in, uh, in, for my talk that um, young male, a lot common and affecting quality of life for this particular age group, difficult to categorize and reach exact diagnosis. Probably the approach would be the same like uh, other age group, but urodynamic may help us to change the diagnosis and also the treatment redirection. Consider multimodal approach. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Azwani. Please allow me to present Dr. Sharif Murad. He's a professor of urology at Ain Shams University, and he's subspecialized in urology, urogyny, and has an interest in lower tract symptoms and voiding dysfunction, to be more specific. Uh, who will present the current management of post-radical prostatectomy and urine confidence. Welcome, Dr. Murad. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the Kuwaiti Urological Association and the Arab Association of Urology for organizing this prestigious meeting. I was asked to present the post prostatectomy incontinence, actually in 10 minutes, so I will try to be very brief. Uh, as part of the anatomy, uh, urinary incontinence in men is controlled by five main structures, the extrusor muscle, the internal sphincter, the urethro, trigonal muscle, the elevator muscles, and the rhabdo sphincter, which is the external sphincter. The risk of post prostatectomy incontinence can range from 3 to 49% at one year. Post-prostatectomy incontinence, stress incontinence may occur after radical prostatectomy, TERP, laser prostatectomy, or open prostatectomy, and other forms of treatments like radiation therapy or brachy therapy or cryotherapy. And with successive treatments, there may be more uh, chance for the incontinence to occur. And it is important to look at the definition of post-prostatectomy incontinence, whether the patient is totally dry or have uh, minimal leakage or with using one pad per day. So the prevalence is, will definitely be affected by this. If we look at the etiopathology, it is not just the sphincter, which is the main problem, but sometimes it is the trusor overactivity or underactivity or low vesicular compliance, and maybe it's the chronic retention. The damage during surgery or bladder dysfunction can occur due to sphincteric shortening or damage of the sphincter layers or the mechanism, or the weakening of the sphincter support, or the affection of the sphincter blood supply or nervous supply, or maybe the pelvic floor itself with direct trauma or with blood or nerve supply damage. Also, we need to look at the detrusor activity because it's not only the sphincter. Sometimes the detrusor is accused whether there's a neurogenic uninhibited contractions, urethrogenic mechanism or anatomic problem, the defunctionalized bladder or detrusor underactivity or bladder outlet obstruction. Most cases of incontinence are a result of intraoperative damage to the native urinary sphincter mechanism, particularly the intrinsic sphincteric component. And the bladder denervation during prostatectomy is also a frequent cause of incontinence after the operation result in impaired detrusor contractility or poor compliance. There are some risk factors, including 
advancing the age at the time of the operation, the neurovascular boundary resection, presence of anatomic structure, increasing the body mass index, increasing prostate volume can also be difficult, or previous history of TERP, and the membrane terrestrial lens at the time of the operation, and of course, surgeon experience and the technique. So what about the management? We have to know, to understand that surgical treatment should be considered only after a period of six to eight, 12 months. And you, you need to try conservative management at the beginning. And there are some surgical tips that you need to, uh, to perform uh, during the surgery that may make it uh, the uh, healing better, like avoiding over the section of the apical musculation and scutra or scutrandic the urethra, maintaining maximum urethral lens without compromising contro cancer control, nerve sparing approach whenever or wherever oncologically safe, bladder neck sparing where feasible or bladder neck reconstruction to prevent funneling of a patellous bladder neck. Eudynamics, some, very helpful sometimes to make sure that there is eudynamic stress incontinence or not, look at the reasonable bladder capacity and compliance, and if there is uh, the trouser overactivity or the trouser overactivity incontinence and urethral pressure profilometry also to get an estimate of the uh, urethral function or the sphincteric function. So we need to define, is it sphincteric deficiency alone or intrinsic sphincteric deficiency with the trouser overactivity or the trouser overactivity alone and with the aid of the PAT test and sometimes urethrocystoscopy, this will help us to advise the patient with the options of artificial sphincter or missling, maybe. So this trace look, uh, shows the truth of overactivity and continence with leakage after the uninhibited contractions. And here is the abdominal leak point pressure, which is, uh, which is the pressure at which the patient leaks when he does series of valsalva tra uh, straining uh, of increasing length, and it measures the sphincteric deficiency. So urodynamic evaluation is important to characterize underlying passive physiology and may be useful before invasive therapy. And in the presence of failed surgery, complex symptoms, congenital anomalies, it is helpful. But there is no predictive value of urodynamic findings and the outcome after either the artificial sphincter or the sling. And even if you have preoperative findings of the trouser overactivity or impaired the trouser contraction, low valsalvalic point pressure, or bladder out of suction, this will not be associated with worse outcomes. Cystoestroscopy is important before uh, doing this invasive surgery. Look at the urethral integrity, the sphincter appearance, is there stricture or not, bladder contraction or not. And the blood, or if there is any bladder pathology, and maybe you do the reposition test also if you are going to use a uh, male sling like the uh, advance. And cystoestrography, KUB, and ultrasound can also help to detect any other abnormality. So, what are the options? Follow up in the early phase, pelvic floor muscle exercise, pharmacotherapy, maybe antimuscarinic or dirixitin. Botulinum toxin injection, bulking agents, slings, adjustable contents balloons, and artificial urinary sphincter. We don't want the patients to keep using penile clamps, actually, so we have to find them an option. If we look at this systemic review and meta analysis, it shows that pelvic floor exercise improved continence at three months, but not at six months after radical prostatectomy, which suggests improvement of the early, but not the late incontinence. Also, uh, this was uh, published in the Lancet, which is one-to-one -one conservative physical therapy for men who are incontinent after prostate surgery, and it is unlikely to be effective or cost-effective. So it is not always, uh, I mean, a good solution to advise for the uh, physical therapy without a real active therapy. What about pharmacotherapy, doxetin, which is serotonin or noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor has been studied, and there is evidence uh, so far suggests that there might be a place for doxetin in the management of serotonin in men. And if you look at the recommendation, 
It shows that you can offer duroxetine in men with stress urinary incontinence, although it is a weak recommendation, but strongly you can have to inform the patient about the possible adverse events of duroxetine and that its use is off-label in, in Europe, for example. Bulking agents is still used, and I can see that it has a role and it helps the patients even uh, to a less extent than artificial sphincter, and it has some complications, including retention, uh, de novo urgency, UTI, hematuria, distant migration, which is not now uh, anymore happening with the new uh, drug, I mean, uh, bulking agents, uh, sometimes extrusion to, for, due to bad injection, and what's the success rate? I can say that it, it reached up to more than 50% right now. But there is weak recommendation that do not offer bulking agents to men with post vasectomy incontinence. Male slings. There are many types of male slings that came up in the market right now, where either the uh, non-adjustable or the adjustable. But we need, we need to look at the selection criteria for the slings. So you, you have to have residual sphincter function. You, you cannot use sling for a completely damaged uh, sphincter. You need to look at the, the history and whether it is mild to moderate incontinence. Uh, or patients that uh, the bad test is less than 30, 300, 400 grams, maybe with more, content, uh, more incontinent in the afternoon, can interrupt stream using during voiding, which means that there is some activity of the sphincter, can hold urine from getting up on the way to the toilet, and he's dry in bed. So this is mild to moderate one. If there is radiotherapy of pre or previous urethral surgery, it is not recommended. Urethral cystoscopy is important to look at the voluntary contraction, <coughs> the retroluminal perineal support test, which is the reposition test, mobility of the membranes urethra, concentric uh, urethral coaptation, and the length of this coaptation. Advanced sling is a retro uh, bulbar uh, sling placement based on concept of relocation of the proximal urethra. Actual mechanism uh, of urinary incontinence control have to be proved yet. Success is around 75 to 90 percent amongst three large case series. It has adverse event of retention, perineal pain, and sometimes compartment hematoma or worsening of incontinence, and sometimes urethral perforation, of course. So the ideal candidate has a fat test less than 300 mil. External sphincter is present, not damaged, no radiotherapy, no previous surgery, and adequate detrusor contractility with post voiding urine less than 100 mils. This is the advanced link, and this is how we apply it. It is fixed and has some tension to make this reposition of the urethra. And this is the virtue male sling, which has two more additional arms to increase the urethral compression. And the adjustable male slings, where you can adjust the uh, tension uh, post-operative or, or release it. But as you can see, we have uh, some of these, the remix, the atoms, and the argus. And this is the guideline saying that offer non-adjustable transobturator slings to men with mild to moderate post prostatectomy incontinence and inform men that severe incontinence prior pelvic radiotherapy or trans research surgery may worsen the outcome of non-adjustable male sling surgery. And there is limited evidence that adjustable male slings can cure or improve the stress urinary incontinence in men. And there is no evidence that adjustability offers additional benefit over other types of slings. So we have to be careful about this and about all this promotion by the companies about the adjustability, which may worsen the problem. What about the adjustable continence balloons and artificial urinary sphincter? Our adjustable continence balloons, as you, uh, you know, it, you have to place it around the bladder neck and you can inflate the balloons to more than one degree where you can control this uh, filling. And the artificial sphincter will give, will give a very few slides about it. You need to have a good patient selection with good manual dextry, good mental capacity, incontinent for at least six months with good urodynamic results as the desire to be dry or near dry. Durability is said to be 10 years, but probably after, after less than seven years, you will need sometimes to change it. Failure include inadvertent inactivation, mechanical 
failure, infections, deflation, erosion, or atrophy. And these are the guidelines saying that offer artificial sphincter to men with moderate to severe stress urine content. Implantation of artificial sphincter or PROACT for men should only be offered in expert centers. And warm men receiving either of these that although cure can be achieved, there is a high risk of complications, mechanical failure, and the need for explantation. Don't offer non-circumferential compres uh, compression device, which is the PROACT, to men who have had pelvic radiotherapy. And last slide, the take home message is that prevalence of post prostatectomy incontinence depends on the definition of continence after uh, radical prostatectomy. Conservative and medical treatment shorten recovery time, but do not cure stress urinary incontinence. Artificial sphincter has passed the test of time and continues to be the gold standard. Slings are a good option for patients with some residual function of the sphincter, and there is a need to better define the concept of mild, moderate, and severe stress urinary incontinence after radical prostatectomy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chef Murad, for this uh, nice presentation. So you move at the next, uh, Dr. Riyad and Musa, about conservative electrical stimulation. It's a consultant neurology and section of neurology of King Fed specialty. You have your microphone. You can go ahead, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, everyone. And. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here in Kuwait. Uh, thanks for uh, the organizing the scientific committee for giving us this opportunity to be here in Kuwait again. It's an amazing uh, uh, conference so far in content and organization, like a really top international meeting. Uh, I was asked to give this talk about conservative versus electrical stimulation under active bladder. These are my disclosures, uh, and there is no financial disclosure for this presentation. Whenever I hear the word underactive bladder or topic underactive bladder, it always takes me to two things. Driving in a foggy weather, where it's really challenging all the time, you'll have difficulties to drive, difficulties even to breathe, but you'll always see light at the end of the road, hoping that you'll reach there. And I'm sure you know, most of you hear the pictures of Prof. Chris Chubble from Sheffield, United Kingdom, who wrote tons of publications about underactive bladder, and myself attended, like many of his presentations, talking about underactive bladder. Why it's foggy talking about underactive bladder? This is a terminology report from International Con uh, Continent Society Working Group. Just by looking at those like names for those who especially in the functional urology field. Look at the names, Chris Chubble, Alan Wynn, Paul Abrams, Victor Nitti, uh, uh, Marcus Drake, and many others. Yet, cons consensus definition of underactive bladder is still lacking. Prevalence is not accurate. Causes and symptoms of underactive bladder are diverse and non-specific. Investigation of choice urodynamics, and probably this is the most solid data available. Clear treatment policy is lacking. That's why when we say it's still really foggy. Definitions, some started definition by saying it's failure to induce emptying at least half of the bladder with involuntary recurrent contractions without the evidence of straining, urethral obstruction, and dysrosis sphincter dysenergia. The International Continental Society defined underactive bladder as a symptom syndrome suggestive of detrosal underactivity. Detrosal underactivity is a urodynamic diagnosis. Detrosal activity, underactivity, a contraction of reduced strength and or duration resulting in a prolonged bladder emptying and or failure to achieve complete bladder emptying within a normal time span. Some people, they went it even more further into more details and they wanted to define it in more quantitative. And they said it's a bladder contraction index of less than 100, or detrosal pressure of maximum flow rate of less than 30, or maximum flow rate of less than 12 millimeter milliliter per second, and bladder outlet obstruction index of less than 20. Still, it's not really clear, and there are a lot of controversy about the definition, but let's say the overall summary that it's an emptying failure. When you talk about prevalence, again, prevalence is not really clear. We're talking about lots of symptoms in general, 
overall, there are uh, uh, around 60, 50 to 60 percent prevalence of LUTs, but when you talk about underactive bladder, we're talking about 9 to 28 percent prevalence in men under age of 50 that reach up to 48 of those over 70 years old male patient, and up to 45 year percent in female patients that varies from 12 to 45. Symptoms, slow, slow urine stream, hesitancy, straining to void, with or without a feeling of incomplete emptying and dribbling, often with the storage symptoms. Urgency was reported to be the most common symptom in patients with uridinemically proven detrosor under activity seen in over, more, in over than 50% of those patients. Isn't it really interesting to have all these symptoms? So is it underactive? or is it bladder outlet obstruction? Is it an overactive bladder? This is the challenging when you go into the treatment. Investigation of choice, as we said, urodynamic st study is the investigation of, co of, uh, of choice. The causes, it's multifactorial. Aging is the most uh, prevalent cause. Bladder outlet obstruction is a cause. Chronic diseases like diabetes or neurological causes. Treatment options, the aim of treatment is to empty the bladder in order to prevent upper tract damage and improve quality of life, prevent or reduce overflow incontinence. There is no accepted approved guidelines for treatment in underactive bladder so far. This is a systemic review that was published recently and they looked at the detrosor underactivity and the underactive bladder. They included almost 1,700 records. And look at the difficulties. Among those 1,700 records, only 13 were selected and included for treatment options. 13 records among 1,700 records. The conservative treatments, either behavioral like time voiding and double voiding, had showed some improvement up to 20 to 23%. SWIT, which is Shockwave, uh, shockwave therapy for the suprabubic area was well tolerated with a statistically significant decrease of detrosor and directivity symptoms and trend to decrease bosphoid residual versus placebo. Probably it's a promising, but it's still early to judge. Manual external bladder compression, credi maneuver or abdominal straining, valsalva maneuver, it's not recommended to be used in patients with underactive bladder. Clean intermittent catheterization, we said, Eurodynamics, probably the most solid data. Clean intermittent catheterization in the treatment, it's probably the most solid data that's really helpful to treat patients or help patients in the aim of having a reduction in their upper tract damage and improve their quality of life. When we talk about pharmacological treatment, and we'll go into a little bit more details when we talk about pharmacological treatments, we have those selections of alpha blockers, cholinesterase inhibitors like distigmine, biridistigmine, or muscarinic uh, agonists like bethencol or cabacol, prostaglandin E2, and uh, acotamide. When we talk about surgical options, sacral nerve stimulation, electrical stimulation, and there will be a few slides about them, Others like injection into the external sphincter like Botox, surgeries for bladder outlet obstruction like TURB or bladder neck incision, reduction cystoplasty, latissimus dorsider, detrosor myoplasty, and stem cell and gene therapies, which is really promising, but still in the early phases. When you talk about pharmacology, alpha blockers, they have in female Fowler syndrome, around 35% improvement, decrease in their voiding symptoms, and uh, improvement in the score by more than 50%. Qmax increased by more than 30% in another study. Cholinesterase inhibitors like distig uh, distigmine, beridistigmine, masculine agents like bethencol and cabacol, they have a very limited efficacy. They are more in animal studies. There are a lot of side effects in the use for human bodies. And still, they are not recommended overall. And most of you know that they are not available in most of the countries, especially uh, including our Gulf countries. Still some people, they're using it and bringing it from some other countries where it's still available. Brostaglandin E2, which is naturally occurring brostaglandin, which function as a direct vasodilator and smooth muscle relaxant and stimulate the trouser contraction directly in experiments. There are a study of 36 patients with other activity. There are 70% 
almost uh, improvement in the trouser function after intravesical prostaglandin E. And prospectively randomized double blind study of 28 patients showed there is no significant effect on post residual urine compared with placebo. So overall, there is a limited therapeutic effect compared with the placebo in clinical trials, and therefore, intravesical prostaglandin E2 would not be recommended as a routine treatment, but may be considered as an additive treatment modality in those patients who are using clean intermittent catheterization. Acutiamide. Acutiamide is one of the new generation first-in-class prokinetic drugs which modulates upper gastrointestinal mortality, and it's approved for patients with functional dys uh, dyspepsia. Studies showed that it enhanced parasympathetic activity by increasing acetylcholinesterase release as well as inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, act sorry, increasing acetylcholine ac release and inhibiting acetylcholinesterase activity. Sigmund Lital conducted a small pilot study of 19 patients with underactive bladder, and after two weeks, they found of using 100 milligrams three times daily, there was a reduction in post void residual significantly from 161 ml to uh, the baseline to 116. More prospective randomized controlled studies would be warranted in the near future. Again, this is a, a promising drug, but still we'll wait for more and more studies. Combination therapies, three groups, four weeks, cholin uh, uh, mimetic drugs, uropedia like uh, alpha blockers, and uh, uh, cholin mimetic drugs and alpha blockers. In this studies, only significant decrease in the international prostate symptom score was in the alpha blocker group and the combination group, but not the cholin mimetic drug alone. Combination therapy of intravesical prostaglandin and oral between chloride showed limited benefits. So none, in conclusion, none of the oral medication used in the underactive bladder is completely effective. When we, quote, when we talk about surgical intravesical electrostimulation, it's direct local muscle contraction, incomplete spinal cord injury patient. The trouser contraction, contraction was achieved in almost 40%. Bladder sensation improved in 75%. Catheter free status in 54%. The limitation is, it's mainly a neurogenic bladder disease and it's very short term. The studies showed the only improvements up to nine months. Posterior tibial nerve stimulation, it's very basic approach. Again, one of the neuromodulation modalities is like acupuncture techniques for Chinese medicine. They're using small needles, 12 sessions for three months every week, and if there is an improvement, there will be an uh, additional 12 sessions over nine months. It's, uh, it's approved for uh, urgency frequency, and again, for retention and fecal incontinence, there is still questions, but it's been used, and there are some studies that it showed some improvement in uh, non-obstructive urinary retention up to 60%, and we have in our study in KFSH that shows 64, 64 improvement percent in 82 patients. When we talk about the efficacy, the studies and the systemic review they said, they said it's limited and should be verified in larger randomized studies. Neuromodulation, this is the last part of the uh, presentation. Uh, neuromodulation, again, it's long history, more than 35 years available in the market, and it's been approved for non-obstructive urinary retention in 1999, and the procedure is simple, but it has two stages, first stage, and if there is an improvement more than 50%, we'll go for the second stage, and this is where it carries the advantage. If there is no improvement, you will not implant the second stage. There are a 12 months study suggestive that's up to 77% improvement in urinary retention, and five years studies that showed there is an improvement up to 78% and up to 58% improvement in the number of uh, residual urine. So in conclusion, underactive bladder is a very challenging condition due to lack of consensus data on definition, clear causes, and treatment modality. Urodynamic is the best tool to assist patients with underactive bladder. The current management of underactive bladder remains unsatisfactory. The multifactorial nature of underactive bladder pathogenesis complicates the appropriate management of each patient. Clean intermittent catheterization is considered to be a vital tool to preserve our tract and improve quality of life in patients with underactive bladder, with the exception of some new medications that are promising but still experimental. None of the oral medications used in the underactive bladder is completely effective. 
Sacral neuromodulation seems to be an effective treatment modality in selected patients with underactive bladder, especially in patients with Fowler syndrome, with good long-term data. More and more research and randomized trials are needed to understand the whole concept of underactive bladder and ultimately tailor the best treatment modalities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Musa. Please allow me to uh, welcome Dr. Ali Thweni. He's a consultant of urology at uh, Dubai. His main interest is uh, urological cancer and uh, uro uh, urology oncology. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here in Kuwait, and a special thanks to the Kuwait Urology Association and the Arab School of Urology for the immense support. Um, so my name is Ali Thweni. I'm a consultant urologist. Um, just to give a bit of background, so I trained in Northern Ireland, this beautiful part of the world, and this is the hospital I trained in, and I was basically a, a laparoscopic partial nephrectomist before I moved to the Middle East, um, and then I did practicing general urology as probably most of us. Um, however, to continue my passion, I went to, to Africa, to Senegal and Nigeria, started a collaboration uh, doing laparoscopic urology workshop chaired by my friend and my boss, Zishan, and uh, we actually managed to establish the proscopic urology service in the car, and we are working in Nigeria. So after the lecture, if anyone is interested to join us, please feel free. So I'm digressing going back. So we learned a lot yesterday and today, uh, lots of knowledge. And uh, this case is just about to apply this knowledge to our daily practice. So this is really, it's, um, it's a very common thing, and hopefully that will stimulate some discussion. So I'm gonna ask you, if you wouldn't mind, you know, and of course the committee as well. So we're talking about the normal patient that comes to your clinic, a 47-year-old male patient presents with lower tract symptoms, storage type, he, he wakes up at night a couple of times, he's sexually active, he's got children, but he wants more. Um, so he tried lifestyle measures, decreasing caffeine, exercise, et cetera, with no avail. So the question is, um, in terms of history, he's fairly fit and well, and that's his clinical assessment, so you can see from the IPSS score, it's 19, so as um, Dr. Yahya's presentation, um, so that's moderate to severe. His Euroflow is uh, 11 mLs per second, voided 1 ET mL, so which makes it a valid uh, Euroflow, and he's got a significant residual of 120 mLs. His PSA is 1.6, kidney function is normal. And then he goes for an ultrasound scan, and it shows a 45-gram prostate. Um, as you can see, there's hardly medial lobe. So the question is really, um, what's next? So these are the options. Um, um, alpha blockers, 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, PD-5 inhibitors, antimarsclinics, beta agonists. I'm gonna ask you, Dr. Sarah, alpha blockers, which one would you choose and why? Yes, I'll try. Maybe tamsulazine, why not? Thank you very much. So as you know, alpha blockers basically, you know, they, we have alpha-1A, alpha-1B, and alpha-1D, so we're talking about highly selective. So Zatrol is one of them, uh, alfuzacine, and of course tamsilocin, and silotocin as well. So they're very effective, and, and literature showed that there's hardly difference between them. Um, what about 5 alpha reductase inhibitors? Anyone would give it to a 47-year-old, Dr. Nebras? No, I will not think that it's okay for a 5 alpha reductase. Maybe I would say with VDE5 inhibitors, better. Uh, what about the size of the prostate? Would that stimulate you? No, not really. Fair enough. So based on the PLES trials and, and COMBAT and M12 trials, so because of the PSA and the prostate size, it might be recommended, but you're absolutely correct. You're a 47-year-old sexual active, 5% risk of sexual dysfunction, gynecomastia. Even for the choice of the alpha blocker, actually, uh, Doctor, uh, choose the Zatal, which is a good choice, because alpha zoosin is less uh, affecting the ejaculatory process. You know, the more selective alpha blockers like tamsulosine or silodocine, it will make re retrograde ejaculation more. So for such a patient with, uh, in his 40s, I think the choice of alpha is, uh, is more suitable. That's brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. That's a very good, very good point. Um, PD-5 inhibitors, Dr. Youssef, what do you think? PD-5 inhibitors, phosphodiesterase, Cialis. 
I think the problem with this patient is not their erectile dysfunction. I know that uh, there's an indication for the PD-5 inhibitors to be used in those patients with BPH, but actually the problem is uh, that we have a, a large postvoidnic residual volume, which is about 120, and at the same time, there is, uh, the, the uroflometry is 11. So we have a significant obstruction. We need to, to get the patient more potent drug to uh, rid him uh, more uh, uh, comfortable with the flow. No, I agree with you. That's, I mean, I, I would probably think twice before giving antimuscarinics. However, studies have shown that the use of antimuscarinics in people with heart residual may not lead to even accentuate your retention, but it's a good point. Um, probably the same thing would apply for beta agonists. So, I mean, as you can see, that's the algorithm for, uh, for the EAU guidance. I'm not going to go through that with the shortage of time. So he comes three months later, and then he's still unhappy. As you can see from the picture, he's yelling at you as a doctor. Um, he failed medical therapy. So the question is, what's next? Um, would you do your dynamics, um, Dr. Yal? You ask me, I'm always fan of your dynamic. If there is a failure of medical therapy, usually yes, I'll discuss with the options, cons and bones for uh, urodynamic, but usually yes. After failure, if all the medications that you mentioned were failed, I'll go with urodynamic. If I rephrase the question, if he's at my age, 52, would you still do it? Okay, anyone who wouldn't do your dynamics? Uh, uh, I will add to your dynamics cystoscopy. I can do it in the same setting. Thank you very much. So, I mean, there are clear indications for your dynamics, and you're absolutely correct. So, these are the indications. I'm not going to go through them. These are based on the guidelines. So. Unexplained significant historical symptoms or high flow rate or um, a significant high residual, and he fits some of the criteria. And of course, his age is a factor because he's less than 50. Um, so he failed medical treatment. So the next thing would be probably surgical intervention. And as we heard yesterday, there are so many surgical interventions, the ablative or resective ones. And uh, the question would you consider surgery? Just a show of hands. He's a 47 year old. Yes? Perfect. Um, so there are so many surgeries. So we have the TORP, Resume, Eurolift, um, transperineal laser ablation. You have the green light laser, uh, thallium laser. There's so many, so many factors. So, um, Mr. Ali, which one did you choose and why? Uh, thank you. Yeah, so um, he's young, and obviously, like I said, he's, he would like to preserve his ejaculation. Um, so in our practice, he will have a cystoscopy. You would want to see the shape of the prostate, check for median lobe. But as we said from Dr. Uh, what we heard from Dr. Rial's talk, most of those guys got primary bladder neck stenosis. So, um, and that's what we see mostly in our practice in the UK. So he would be a, either a good candidate for ITIN or um, bladder neck incision with Eurolift clips. Um, that's what I would offer him. Any other options, Dr. Sharif? I'm sorry, Dr. Ali, but we didn't mention anything about the possibility of chronic prostatitis for this patient. With, uh, with this age, with uh, the, even the size, we see it with prostatic congestion, not real hyperplasia. So we didn't, we didn't try to give him any sort of treatment for this, which is the norm in our practice. I see every day many of these patients, and I never go to these invasive therapies before one year of trying with them. But I think that this is another, we are in a, some sort of medical uh, meeting, so I know that you want to make it case, but I will go, if, if we will do something, I will go to resume. Oh, that's perfect. We just would like to put in our mind the finding of cystoscopy. Uh, if there is a big middle lobe, so this decision will be uh, changed to TRP maybe. Absolutely. So I heard that. Well, thank you for mentioning prostatitis. Of course, it's one of the things in differential diagnosis. However, I mean, I specifically tailored it towards body dysfunction, but definitely as a clinician in, in daily practice. We, is cystoscopy something really essential here? I think so, because um, we, he fed the medical therapy and he's got, he's young and he's got some uh, voiding lots, so I think as Mr. Ali des described before, the cystoscopy will allow us to know the anatomy of the, of the prostate and the shape of the resonant median lobe. So I, 
definitely we go for the cystoscopy and you dynamics. Thank you so much. So just make it more. Yeah, I have a question uh, regarding yes, his uh, bladder leak. So what uh, Dr. Riyad mentioned and uh, Dr. Ghazi regarding the cystoscopy and uh, I would add epidural dynamics. So I think uh, the bladder neck is one of the main concerns. And I wouldn't go uh, and uh, be so enthusiastic about surgical intervention for his age and his post void. He had a significant post void. So I may consider botox of his bladder neck, which is something like temporarily, if it benefit, fair or well, if it didn't, it's like six months and it's gonna go away. So doing a resume or something surgical at his age, ejaculation is something that I wouldn't risk it for the meantime. Yeah, that's very, very interesting interjection. Um, I just, for the old patient like this, yes, if you can go very fast, because we see, uh, even in, the, in prevalency, in our country, you usually have erythrastenosis, post infection erythrastenosis. So, uh, it, we have this man, 14 years, for me, BPH is the second time, so we go, since fibroscopy, flexible, you can see rapidly, if median lobe, or have uh, bladder neck, or have urethastenosis. It's very fast, because you have obstruction, you have residual volume, so this is, uh, and sometimes you find, you find uh, stenosis or prostatis, uh, uh, chronic prostatis. Thank you, thank you. Hi, Dr. Rohit here from India. See, one thing which we are missing here is we, any, any treatment guidelines for this particular patient should be focused on quality of life. You know, if, if, if you do something to cure his urinary problem, if we end up causing problems with ejaculation and sexual function, it, it is actually a, a worse thing than what he has actually. So this is particular case where I think will be fitting ideally for a Eurolift. Having said that, if you do a video urodynamic study and rule out urethral stenosis by a preliminary cystoscopy, we rule out urethral stricture, bladder neck obstruction, and a big sizable median lobe. If these are not there, Eurolift will be ideally pitching for such kind of patients because it doesn't affect sexual function and it enhances better emptying with minimal kind of intervention. So I'll pitch in for that. Thank you very much. And so many other minimal invasive like the resume and the TPLA as well. Um, is CURB still the gold standard, Professor Bulber? Yeah. Well, there's no gold standards, really. It's one, one of the favorable options, let's put it this way. The gold standard is a... I think, I think this is a 47-year-old man, and he's, he's going to live for the next 50 years, maybe, 40 years. All these studies, all the, the new trends we have, don't have that durability of of at least of, of action. The Uri left, the resume, all these. And most of these people have a bladder neck stenosis after you rule out a stricture. Pro probably a 47 year old man. It's the only guy time I will do a cystoscopy on a guy with LUTs. And if he failed multiple, multiple uh, uh, LUTs. The quality of life issue is so important. Uh, and uh, so you, if you want to choose a procedure, if you have to, after he fails multiple, because we don't know why some people fail one alpha blocker respond to another. There are so many things we don't know. We don't know why they fail alpha blockers first. There's not much research on that. And why they respond to another, the durability uh, 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 of this. But then the patient doesn't care about post void residual. He cares about he wants to pee fine. He wants just to void normally. But we, we, we use it as, as one of those Parameters. So if you want to use it, I think the Eurolift, for example, what's, what, how, how many years we have used the Eurolift? This guy is going to live for years. What's going to be the prognosis for him? TUIP has been the standard of care for such patients if you decide on, on, uh, on, 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 on treatment. Uh, you have to think about this in, in, in the context of that. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wilbert. I mean, the way I sell it to the patients, actually, I do that on my daily practice. He's a 47-year-old. I would tell him that we don't have long-term data, but we have data for the next six, seven, eight years, maybe. So that will reach him to an older stage, and then he would be more accepting to the so-called gold standard. So, um, okay, so just to make it more interesting, as was mentioned, I didn't do cystoscopy. I'm a bad urologist, so I went straight for GA, and uh, that's what I found. So one centimeter proximal bulbar stricture. The question is, would you incise or dilate the stricture, carry on uh, prosthetic surgery, or just dilate the stricture, 
or would you do an optilum, daclitaxel coated, or mitomycin uh, coated balloon, as uh, Professor Esan did it before, um, with or without? So would you treat two pathologies at the same time or not? Yeah, it's easy. I'm not going to ask anyone. So obviously, I can see the, the body language here. So that's fair enough. So again, um, the, the ultrasonographer was not great. I didn't do cystoscopy. And at the time, you found a bladder tumor, a small bladder tumor. Would you deal with bladder tumor? Would you do a TRP? Would you do both? Both? How many would do both? TO, let's say bladder tumor and prosthetic intervention, whatever it is. No, no, forget about the structure. I, th I, think, I think bladder structure, you can do it, and bladder tumor, but you cannot combine. You have no, no data for, uh, to combine bladder tumor and TERP. Because, because you see that you know that now, until now, the tumor, cell tumor for erythritis, he can, he can do jumping, he can do accusation, the prostate, and you see in the follow-up some tumor to go to erythral and prostate. So if it respects, you must do first blood tumor and after that. So I'm going to ask Mr. Ali if that's okay, what, what the Abbas colleagues think. Um, let's say it's a TORP plus TORBT, just to make it simple, there's no structure. Yeah, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't generally combine the two procedures for two reasons. One, like we said, with, with urothelial carcinoma, there's always a risk of seeding, always. Um, that's number one. Number two, you want to, to understand what, obviously, grade or stage of the bladder tumor is, because that will then determine what you're going to do next, and what is, obviously, the link of that tumor to his symptoms. His symptoms were mostly storage, which could be coming from his bladder tumor. So if you could cure him with just, you know, curing him of his bladder cancer, especially if he's got carcinoma in situ, which we all know could present with storage symptoms. So that might solve us all his problems. Uh, Excellent I'll, point, I'll Ahmed. definitely go with the TRBT, and since you're going with the she, it's that she's 26, so it's more than enough to dilate his structure. So, two and one. Amr. Thank you. I think it has to be an individualized decision. Uh, it depends on what you look and what you're going for. So if you're going for a patient, so forget about this patient, because this is a young patient and quite problematic, but if you're talking about a patient who is 65, and you know that the prostate is a problem anyhow, but you find an incidental tumor, and it's like one centimeter or something, and most likely this is not causing any problems, then probably you can do both procedures. I may advocate to go for something like, I mean, if we're talking about 40, 50 gram, and we found this in a couple of occasions, and we're going for a zoom, we find a small tumor. We tend to small tumor remove, few injection, there's no seeding risk there, because you're not cutting into the, into the, uh, into the prostate. However, if you go and find five centimeter tumor, and it's partially blocking the bladder neck, and you know that this patient came originally with a irritative symptom, and this was a complete surprise, as he was not completely assessed beforehand, as you said, then I'll probably go only for the TRPT. So I think it's kind of uh, a decision that you have to make, and just to put all, all these criteria, not, there's no standard here. You have to go and decide according to what you find in front of you and deal with it. Thank you very much, Al. And just to mention, actually, there is one publication. Uh, I use it in my exam, actually. So it's a 10-year-old publication. They looked at hundreds of patients, TRBT and TRP at the same time, and there's no significant prostatic urethral seeding. But again, just for information. So I think the most important thing is, you know, we are treating not a pathology. We're treating the patient bearing that pathology. And as you know, in the traditional, we used to have what's called the hald rings, just three circles, which amount towards LUTs which is this overactive bladder plus prostate plus. Well, now what we're dealing with all this. So we have to have a lateral thinking and all, you know, all these things has to be thought out. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for these nice cases. So we move at the last presentation. Abdullah, Dr. Abdullah Razi for uh, implantation of artificial sphincter. is a neurology and genital reconstructive surgeon on, at the King Faisal Special Hospital and the Center in, in Medina. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, conference. And uh, really, uh, I enjoy uh, to be in Kuwait for the first time. 
the good thing, uh, part of my presentation was pre presented by uh, Prof. Uh, Sharif. Uh, it will be easier for me. I will concentrate on the surgical uh, technique of insertion, insertion of artificial earth sphincter. This is uh, the third branch of King Faisal Specialist Hospital uh, in Medina that recently uh, started. Uh, I don't have disclosure. Uh, as we know, uh, continent mechanism in men is complex. It is not a one uh, part of the pelvic organ uh, can uh, control uh, the continent. We have the detrosal muscle itself, bladder neck, prostate, pelvic uh, floor, and the length of, uh, of urethra itself. All combined uh, that control uh, continent mechanism in men. There are a lot of etiology for urinary incontinence, especially stress. Uh, most of it mentioned in previous uh, uh, presentation. Uh, some uh, causing internal sphincter uh, deficiency, like pelvic surgery, bladder neck injury, sympathetic neuropathic dysfunction, uh, or embryological uh, disruption. External sphincter, mostly second, uh, due to radical prostatectomy, urethral disruption, myopathy, or spine, neurogenic secondary to spinal cord uh, diseases. The most common in, uh, uh, the indication of uh, art, uh, implant of artificial urethral sphincter is radical prostatectomy that represent uh, four to eight percent of patient post radical prostatectomy. And surgical option of urinary incontinence after uh, radical prostatectomies are uh, mentioned before bulking agent. Uh, bulbar urethral sling or uh, sphincter. Uh, just one slide for each, uh, for each uh, treatment modality. Uh, as mentioned before, bulking agent is still not recommended, especially in severe incontinence. It has limited evidence. Sling, male sling, it is, it is effective in mild to moderate uh, incontinence, that's 70 to 85 percent success rate, despite uh, no uh, agreement uh, uh, about the definition of uh, incontinence severity. It, uh, it is a short uh, procedure time, 45 to 60 minutes, with uh, minimal uh, complication. This is the main talk about artificial urethral sphincter. It is the gold standard uh, for, uh, especially for moderate to severe incontinence with high success rate, reached 95%. Uh, the surgical procedure take uh, 60 to 90 minutes with a reasonable complication rate. Uh, this is the previous uh, types of sphincter. This is from AM, uh, AM, uh, AMS. Different type, different, uh, different style, but all now uh, uh, replaced by the new one, 800 AMS. This is other type from other company like Flow Secure on, uh, on the left uh, hand side, the right one uh, from uh, Zephyr. This uh, AMS 800, this is the one I will talk about it. Uh, contraindication for uh, to implant uh, artificial urethral sphincter is uh, bladder disorder, uh, like decreased bladder compliance, VUR, especially in low uh, bladder pressure, inadequate tissue integrity at the bladder neck and urethra. Relative contraindication is uh, need frequent uh, instrumentation in case of bladder, bladder tumor or refractory stricture. Uh, now, for the surgical technique, this is we have to prepare our uh, table. We have to have two tables, one for the surgical implant, the other, other table for uh, the uh, device itself. This is how I, I arrange it. Arrange my, uh, I have to have two basin, uh, one for washing and other for uh, device preparation. Uh, I have to prepare my uh, uh, rubber shot uh, forceps. Uh, and syringes. Um, AMS uh, 800 uh, come with one bump, 
and uh, three uh, sizes of uh, uh, reservoir. The most common use is between 60 uh, to 70 centimeters of, uh, of water. Uh, cuff size range uh, between 3.5 to 11. The most common used in, uh, in men is 4 to 4.5 centimeter. Uh, and accessory kit just to insert uh, the device. We can see this video. This is the surgical uh, table. Uh, the table, I have to have two tables, one for uh, the surgery itself and one for the device. Then I have to have one separate uh, basin for, uh, to wash my hand from any deposit of blood. The other one for uh, preparation of device. We have to prepare three parts of artificial sphincter, cuff, uh, sphincter, uh, pump, and, uh, um, and the reservoir. Empty all air from cuff and uh, reservoir and fill uh, uh, the pump with, with saline. I have to shake it several times. Sometimes I have to tape it a little bit just to move uh, the all uh, bubbles outside. Okay. Now this is the other video. I have to prep the patient uh, first for 10 minutes with uh, bovidone, then uh, uh, chlorohydroxy. Uh, uh, Chlorohydroxidase, uh, then uh, perineal incision. I will start with perineal incision and uh, incision of iliospongiosus muscle. Uh, uh, then I uh, do a ret retract, uh, retraction with uh, silk for, for the muscle with uh, figure of eight. Uh, some surgeons do a very small incision, and uh, for me, uh, I like to have really good incision. It will not make a uh, difference for the outcome, but it will make the, the surgical uh, incision uh, or the exposure better. Then after the section of urethra, I have to take care. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, I have to take care uh, in uh, dissection of urethra from, from the corpora uh, cover nose, not to injure the, the urethra, uh, because if I injure the urethra, I have to terminate the procedure. Okay, it is going on. We have to take our time in, uh, in dissection. Okay, measuring, uh, measuring the urethra, we have to do it with catheter and without catheter. Uh, catheter. Uh, in, in reality, I, uh, I could not see any difference in measuring between catheter or, or, or without. But anyway, usually most of the time we are uh, the measurement between uh, four and four and a half uh, centimeter. Sometimes three and a half, we can use it if we uh, plan to do uh, uh, the cuff in distal location as uh, than the usual one. Uh, this is after we put the, the cuff, we have to be sure that we secure uh, the cuff in place just to avoid uh, dislodge from uh, this part. Okay, then uh, to insert the, uh, the reservoir, I go uh, to the suprapubic uh, area, just above the pubic bone, S open small incision, two to three centimeter, just incision to the uh, fascia, uh, and put it just uh, uh, behind the pubic bone. I have to face some fibrosis, it is okay. Then uh, I have to take uh, long Kelly just to create uh, the tract for the bump. It should be, uh, it should go to subdartos. 
Okay, then I have to pull it and just to put, to put it in the dependent area of the scrotum. And, uh, then I have to trim, uh, trim uh, extra uh, tubes, uh, be, sure, uh, be sure all air bubbles uh, came out, then fill the, the reservoir by uh, 23 centimeter of, uh, of water. After uh, connection all tubes, uh, white to white, black to black, uh, I can test the device several times. I can see the dimple uh, on the sphincter, and I can do cystoscopy to see uh, the efficacy. The most important is the vascularity of the uh, vascularity of uh, the, the urethra and the coaptation of uh, urethral mucosa. Thank you. So much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ghazi. Uh, please allow me to conclude this, uh, this session, and I would like to thank the general the speakers for their enriching uh, presentations. And uh, allow me to have five minutes uh, questions for all of the speakers. Please feel free. 